few days after Sammy Davis was diagnosed with throat cancer, he and I were both recipients of the Black Emmy Awards in Hollywood. But you never would have known he was suffering from a terminal disease. Sammy Davis was a class act. For example, during his acceptance speech, he said no matter how classy the award, he was just a saloon singer. When I interviewed him over the years, he gave what I think was the real Sammy Davis. He also seemed to enjoy coming home, taking off the mask needed to survive racism. You've seen many tributes to Sammy Davis and he deserves every one of them. He also deserves a place in history. What you're about to see is an evolution. Sammy Davis, the child star, to the rat packer, to the fiery activist, to the seasoned superstar. And by the end of the program, you should also know the answers to the following questions. I keep thinking now, just a few days ago. What were the three movies Sammy Davis starred in with Frank Sinatra and the so-called Rat Pack? In what decade did Sammy Davis star in both Anna Lucasta and Porgy and Bess? Sammy Davis's first big break as an entertainer came in 1946 when he appeared on stage as part of the Will Maston Trio with Count Basie and Billie Holiday at what famous New York City theater? What was the name of the television network where Sammy Davis was instrumental in changing the hiring practices toward blacks? In spite of what he said, Sammy Davis was a lot more than just a saloon singer. He was a black man making his way in a white world, and he did it to death. I'm Tony Brown. In a moment, the evolution of Sammy Davis Jr. Went into the army, you know, that, that horrible, that was my first taste really of uh, racism, you know, ever, because I never had been exposed to it being in show business, you know. You know, you'd run into the average bit of it, but not, um, not enough to, to upset you or anything. You know, or not even to be aware of, because I'm in show business, so I wasn't aware of it. And as a kid being in show business, you, I didn't learn until later the, about why we slept in bus stations and why we had to uh, go to the police and say, where's their colored family that you can stay with? Because you couldn't get into hotels and things like that, and you couldn't eat in this restaurant. But there was a very close fraternity between most of the black and white performers at that time uh, that doesn't exist today. What were some specific examples of when you started first getting the message? Well, I think the, the first real thing that I got was in the army when I, you know, and I was in basic training and then I hadn't even gone to basic training. I went in in San Francisco, we went to the Presidio of Monterey and the third day I was standing in line and this was before uh, desegregation came in the army, you know. Uh, and I was standing in line and at, at, the, at this place where there was black and white soldiers and the cat said, you know, where I come from, niggas, you know, stand in the back and they, they ain't here. I forget the exact line. Now, and I had my, my duffel bag, not my duffel bag, but you know the thing they used to carry your shaving equipment in? And I just sundied him, you know, and knocked him down and had cut his lip and he's bleeding from the lip and he said, uh, Okay, you knocked me down, but you're still a nigger. And that laid with me, you know, because that, that's, that's so, so venomous. It really is, you know, that, that's the kind of cat that you ain't gonna never reach. And, and, and I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. Money don't make you free. Popularity don't make you free. Don't you know that? You know, sure, I live in Beverly Hills, but I'm shackled by the same things that happened to the brother in Watts. Sammy, it was 1971 when we sat down, very similar to this, and it was one of the most candid, honest interviews I have ever done in my career. Where are you now compared to, to, the, to then? I would like to think at least a couple of steps ahead of where I was then. Uh, It's been a good life for me, you know, and uh, God knows I've survived where other cats would have been down the tubes 10 to 1, you know. But that's only because 
perhaps, of what you saw in that interview. Because that happens to be, incidentally, I'm not doing rub your back, you rub mine, Jess, but it happens to be one of my favorite interviews of all times, you know. And uh, it is just that if you feel comfortable about yourself, and that was the beginning of my feeling comfortable about myself, my liking myself. Because for a long time, it didn't like me. You know, I didn't like what I, what I was trying to ascertain. I didn't like how I had gotten there. And I can look back on that now and say that. But at the time, I, I was just starting to make the bend. So that you caught me at the, at the beginning of my honesty. Solo 71424, scene 22, take 33, sound 22. I think I got most of that, baby. <laughs> I swear for God, you got me to that. <laughs> Let's talk about not your dishonesty. Let's talk about the period before the bend, before the candor. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Frightening now that I look back on it. When you're in the midst of, uh, of a hurricane, your only thing is to hope that you, someone will set you down that you'll get some solid ground. But as you're spinning in that hurricane or in that tornado and it's going, you're just hope, trying to grab at anything you can. And I think we emotionally do that, and particularly black artists. And black artists who have lived in both worlds, the black world, the white world, and succeeds more in one world than he does in the other and can't get the crossover and all of those cliches, you know. 